So I wish, I think uh, Rial's presentation should have been right after lunch. It was pretty entertaining and I think could have uh, kept everyone awake. I'm going to try and, you know, not put you to sleep. So uh, as D Denise said, we're going to talk about data APIs and beyond. I took Cloud 2.0 out of it. So, you know, you're going to hear about this term, I think, this year and going forward, Cloud 2.0, since she mentioned it. So I think, uh, the prediction I read is like saying cloud 1.0 1, 1 was all about taking your compute to the cloud. And now 2.0 is going to be how you are going to monetize, how you're going to use, you know, get value out of data. And I think, and I think we are doing ourselves, I think with our data warehouse team taking our data to cloud, that is cloud 2.0. I don't know if this is official term, but I think uh, it will be, it will be coming soon. Or it's already here. So about me, uh, uh, while I was watching other presentations, I felt you know awkward, like I didn't put any pictures of me or anybody uh, in my family. Then I thought, I think I have two kids, so maybe that's the reason. <laughs> so this was a joke, so I don't want to scare people <laughs> who are going to be parents soon or who are, who are planning to have kids. So you know, please ignore that. I was just lazy. So. Uh, about me, uh, I'm Nitin Mahajan, and I'm responsible for service engineering department. Uh, the mission of the department is to provide data as a service, and and beyond basically any kind of service which 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 leads into data services. Uh, I have been with admins for almost a decade, and I don't think anything I did before that is relevant anymore. So uh, I started. Uh, on ad tool projects at Edmunds, and uh, since then uh, worked on Finder, Search, on top of Solar, uh, did some uh, major re-architecture projects, uh, XRR, Photos, Real brought up coherence, so we uh, you know, took coherence out of our stack, uh, and then I think, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was from other room? <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, then I was involved in rewriting of pricing tool and reporting tool, which was one of the major component with uh, uh, you know nationwide price promise launch. Uh, last couple of years, I was managing ingestion team. Uh, it was really fun learning and challenging. As of now, I still manage data tools and microservice. You could microservice APIs. So that's about me. Uh, agenda, I think I, I tend to you know, get into history before I get into what's coming next, and, uh, and I, I could see how Renault did that same, so I'm not, not the only one you know, who's, who's talking where we started from and where we're heading into. After looking at history and impact on business of APIs, uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, introduction to admins APIs, uh, and then we'll talk about what's next you know, beyond APIs. So uh, API is pretty loaded term and you could use it and people use it. Even if I talk about REST API, I could use API for a resource or endpoint or entire API package. So, you know, uh, bear with me, like when I say API, it's, it's a bigger concept, you know. Uh, you could think it as a, a contract or how two components are going to talk to each other over in a distributed system. So this slide is uh, telling you know how the how how we reached to REST APIs or web APIs today. Uh, back in 90s, you know when uh, distributed computing started, that's when people started calling processes on different computers, and that's when we got RPC. And at same time, internet and object-oriented programming was you know uh, was picking up, and combination of those two, or I should use the word marriage. It's the theme today. So marriage of those two, uh, you know, uh, led into CORBA, COM, RMI, and these were binary protocols. Uh, as we all know, being developers, we we like readable stuff. We don't like binaries, and uh, that's when SOAP started picking up. When SOAP was became pop popular, it led into SOA, and around turn of the century, uh, with internet picking up. Uh, developers wanted to have even lighter weight and JSON HTTP based uh, APIs. So that's when we 
started getting into web APIs or REST APIs. Uh, so this slide is relevant. I think down the line we'll see uh, how, what is the evolution, where we're going next. And over here, if you see uh, oh, some facts, like Salesforce was the, technically the first company which, which was selling APIs uh, in, in the form of internet as a service back in 2000. eBay and Amazon followed them. And this graph here is showing the growth of APIs. Uh, if I, I'll just read this. It's saying growth in web APIs since 2005. This is from Programmable Web. And what it shows is uh, number of companies who are registered as public, uh, as exposing public APIs. And you could see around 2010 and 11, that's when it spiked. I think a ton of companies started exposing public APIs and started benefiting from uh, you know, wider uh, uh, visibility and getting an audience across the board. Uh, I, I was surprised. I didn't really realize like we launched our first API in 2011. This is, again, data I took from Programmable Web when we saw our first vehicle API was registered in 2011. Probably a smile or someone was working on that. So, uh, in the last 10 years, we have seen exponential growth in all these industries like e-commerce, mobile, uh, social platforms, Internet of Things, cloud. And uh, one thing which has been key enabler in this is API, how people could really expose and use data uh, easily. And it basically, you know, uh, APIs doesn't take all the credit, but it's, it has been enabler for this exponential growth. So let's get into uh, APIs at Edmunds. Uh, just a quick check. Everybody awake? <laughs> OK. Uh, APIs at Edmunds. So a uh, couple of years ago, or I said three or four or five years ago, uh, we converted all our uh, embedded services into RESTful decoupled services, a point I took from Real slide. You know, you have to have loosely coupled components. And there were, there were times when just to pro promote a service change, we would take like three to four weeks. You know, you have to rebuild 30 to 40 artifacts. And now we have microservices. I'm using this term microservice. This is also heavily loaded. You could think Docker or anything. I'm talking in context of uh, API doing a single responsibility. That's a vehicle API or a region API. That's, that's what I mean microservice here. It's doing one thing. Uh, and and we do see the benefit, actually, of uh, heading into uh, those microservice kind of APIs. We have done uh, several redesigns in the last few years, like uh, uh, doing next gen, moving to groundwork, and Venom. So APIs are enablers here, where you have decoupled data tier, and uh, it helps you move faster. A quick trivia question. So does anyone know total number of REST web applications we have in our media environment. When I say media, I mean prod 11, prod 21. People who don't know that, please excuse me for this. So uh, any guesses? Stefan, you can't say that. 30, 15, what else? 50? You're close, buddy. So it is, it is 34. So that 34 REST web apps, and this is not counting car codes or DSG web apps. This is pure uh, REST web apps, which is serving our website. Another one, uh, highest traffic API. Region. Region. See, everybody knows this. <laughs> did, did the exam get leaked? You know, like, how did people know this? You know? So region API, it, it gets like 400 queries per second, and uh, we are looking at 98th percentile response time of 9 milliseconds. So this was, I think, the biggest winner when we migrated from coherence to uh, REST API, Mongo-backed. So, so far, so good. Uh, APIs does have challenges, and this is where I think we need to keep in context the history and the challenges we have now and how the time and need and business is evolving. The challenges are uh, 
having run this department for several years now, I find it really tough to have consistent API design, not just across the team, within my team. And uh, we did put RFC process in place. It is cumbersome, it takes time, it delays, and uh, no, two, no two people can write, you know. Uh, this is, this is a very, uh, uh, one of the challenges uh, I face day to day. Documentation becomes a thing. You don't get documentation for free, and one of our desires has been to train admins, not just technology, but even business. Hey, what is our domain? And we do aspire to use APIs or some form of this platform to you know, have this education spread, uh, but we haven't really nailed it down yet. Uh, next two, or the third one, is multiple round trips. Microservices are awesome, but it comes at a cost of multiple round trips. You have to make several network calls to get, get data back, You're getting, and, and you have to join it together. And the last one is overfetching. Uh, you may need, and I'll show this example, like you may need you know, two data points, and uh, it, it could be uh, oversight, or you don't have an API which gives you what you need, and you have to fetch basically tons of junk uh, in context of a, your use case. So this slide saying, what got you here won't get you there. So APIs has done really great uh, in whatever form. I'm calling everything APIs, you know. So the current norm of APIs got us at a very good place, not just us, like in overall industry. And now is the time to change. And what, what we need is more agility, more efficiency, and which is going to power innovation. So that is the purpose of whatever we are doing here, or you know, uh, at least from uh, my department, I think it applies to everyone. You know, what from technology we want to give more agility to business, efficiency, and innovation, so that we could uh, beat the competition and stay relevant. So, rest of my presentation is uh, geared towards that. Anybody recognizes this this vehicle here? Yeah, exactly. So this is Toyota e -Pallet. Uh This was introduced uh, in 2018 CES show, and I'm going to read out what it is. Uh, it is Toyota e -Pallet. It's a de delivery truck-sized reconfigurable autonomous pod. It can be pop-up shop, Amazon delivery truck, or Uber as needed. So isn't it amazing, like, you know, and this is where our APIs need to go, you know, it should do what you need to do, and you don't have to rebuild things, you know, again and again. Uh, I, so let's get into this. Uh, let me quickly show what uh, the problem of overfetching I was uh, talking about, and This is our vehicle API, or I should call, say, vehicle resource, and this is actual endpoint. What uh, we are asking uh, in, a, in a URL is saying, hey, you know, give me, uh, give me everything about a uh, style with the ID 12374. And vehicle is our richest domain. What you could see in this, in this uh, browser response is tons of information. I think this is, I could keep going on, and you can't really make out what all is in this domain. Uh, so, and if you're a user and you don't pay attention, if you're if you're a website developer or any any user, you don't pay attention and you say, hey, there's an API, I'm going to call it, you're going to get a big performance overhead. Uh, so, we were cognizant of this and we were trying to solve this problem. Uh, at the time, we did. Uh, coherence migration, we build vehicle v3 APIs. We said, hey, you know, that doesn't make sense. We need to give our developers uh, ability to pick, pick and choose what they need. And this concept is called either sparse fields or you could call, call it projections. Uh, maybe I should go back to slide. So you, you get the meaning here. So what we are saying is uh, you could pick the fields you want. You're saying, hey, I need ID, year, make name, model name, price, and from trim, all I need is its nice name. I don't care about anything else. 
it does the job of uh, overfetching, but it is complicated. You, you don't have an easy way to figure out, you have to go over this huge response to see what you need, and then you have to manually make that, you know, uh, uh, looking at the JSON graph, you have to figure out, hey, which fields make sense, and it's, it's painful. So while we at Edmunds were trying to uh, solve this problem, there were bigger players out in industry who were trying to solve the same problem. And this is where uh, I have two of them listed here, our most popular one. Netflix Falcor, uh, it is a JavaScript library for efficient data fetching, and a Facebook GraphQL. Uh, GraphQL is a query language for your API. Uh, as I think Rial said, and I think even Renault, I think you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So there are companies with, with deeper pockets and bigger resources who are solving the problem. Uh, and the rest of my presentation is going to talk about GraphQL and how it fits, uh, give introduction to GraphQL, what it is, and how it could play a role in beyond APIs or you know where it's going to take our APIs. Before I go any further, I think uh, probably a lot of you have heard this term. Uh, it's a misleading term. Uh, you could think several things out of it. GraphQL is a language for your API. It's a query language for your API. And what it does is it ask, uh, you ask for what you need, and you get exactly that. And you could get many resources in a single request. So you are, you are, you are basically getting ready for let's say mobile first kind of uh, world where you, you don't have that uh, flexibility to you know, fetch a lot of data. You need things faster, you need, uh, you need performance. Uh, I just wanted to call out uh, for you know, avoiding any confusions, GraphQL is not a database. And GraphQL nor it is a query language for GraphDB. So just to make sure it's, it has nothing to do with graph database or uh, or it's not a query language only for GraphQL. Sorry, GraphDB. Uh, a brief history, uh, GraphQL is developed by Facebook, and I think they started for their native mobile apps. Uh, first time they publicly talked about this in 2015 at a React conference, uh, I believe, and it, it can be implemented in several programming languages. I'm not going to re uh, talk about that, I think we, touched that problem. Uh, let's, let's get a little bit into the core concepts of GraphQL. Uh, GraphQL has a schema and a type system. So if you look at uh, on the right side, uh, basically we uh, actually Matt Altermat uh, has a POC which I'm going to show in uh, after a couple of slides. So I'll hold my thought there. Uh, so what we are trying to do is we're we took our use case where we are taking our style schema, our style object, and trying to model it using graph schema. And, and the first entity here is make. Uh, it's called object types in GraphQL terms. And this is, in simple terms, let's say this is your domain. You are modeling your domain, and you're saying, hey, ID is a non lullable field. You need to have ID for a make. And uh, then these are scalar values. And pub state is another uh, another object type. Everything eventually end up into a scalar value. And we are saying, hey, you have a model. If I have to read this out, all types exposed are defined in a schema. So all these are types which are exposed in a schema, which becomes a contract between client and server. So now you, you're working against a contract all the time, uh, which basically is, is a good thing, and I think, uh, 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 I'll not jump ahead, so I got tempted to. So once you have model, uh, then other thing you need to do is you need to do some operations. And uh, GraphQL gives you three different, uh, uh, you know, uh, th this is a query type, then you have mutations, and then you have subscriptions. Query type is the entry point to your graph. This is the, whatever you define here, that's the only way you could enter to your graph. We'll see this in, in the demo. Uh, and if I have to give analogy of uh, REST, this is basically get request. We use get request to get data back in, in REST API world. 
here you are going to do make a query the difference is everything is going to be post call and uh, and yeah everything is post call in in graphql now mutations is if you want to create or update an object you will be defining mutations you don't have to have mutations you need to have a query else you have no entry to your graph uh, this is analogous to put and post request in rest world subscriptions are interesting concept and uh, let me talk about this so subscription is unlike request response model this is uh, this is where a, it's a streaming model where a client could say hey i want a subscription with object type new make and give me id and name whenever a change happens to new make object uh, and I was thinking of example which Rachel was talking about, you know, if I am on a VDP page, uh, if a consumer is on VDP page, we could build models behind the scene which are populating a domain object. And moment, let's say a better deal comes or, you know, hey, you are looking at a Camry, I want to show you some other, uh, you know, make model here. You could, you could have subscriptions and it's going to pop up right away on your, on your page. Uh, now, we talked about how to query, uh, sorry, the different inter interfaces. Now, I'm going to quickly skip through this slide, but in, in short, there's concept of resolver functions. This is what is exactly getting data from your database or let's say API or whatever. So this is the layer which is talking with, uh, with your data source. Now, uh, each field has a resolver function, it's, it's little, it's not super complicated, but I think it, has, it needs its own session. So uh, let's get into demo. So this, this is deployed in QA21 uh, and deployed, we have a GraphQL server deployed in vehicle data rest web. And this is where Matt, Alter Matt helped me. He had to leave before the session due to some reason. Uh, so let's look at the power of GraphQL. Is it any better? Oh, I can't see it now. <laughs> Let's see this. So the cool, okay, let me even get rid of this. The cool part of GraphQL the problems we are talking about is it has this auto suggest. And as I was referring, you know, there is always an entry point to GraphQL. To, to your graph uh, domain and all makes is what we have implemented. And this tells you how you can enter your graph and moment I do this, you could keep auto, you could use, use auto suggestion and see what all is available and what do you want for your use, use case. You could keep playing with it. And let's say, I'm going to say, hey, give me, give me all, this is hitting our, uh, this case is hitting directly MongoDB, but we are thinking of doing different way. This went down to database and got back uh, all the makes uh, we have in our database. You could do filtering, sorting, and the cool part is uh, the auto suggestions. I could go and say, hey, order by, I want descending. Now, to not do overfetching, what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit this to one make. So let's say make name is all I got is, and I could start, you know, uh, this is where I could start getting into the graph. I'm going to say, give me all the models. And I could start saying, what do I need out of models? I need uh, its nice name. I need its submodels. Let's try this, I think. Yeah. So now, as of now, we have seen this entire style object as one entity, but we could break it down into smaller components, which, which is more readable and more digestible than seeing a huge, huge response. So. Uh, 
let me show another aspect of this. So there are cool tools which can help you, you know, view your schema uh, in a in a nice uh, graph form. So I'm going to introspect. I'm going to introspect our GraphQL server endpoint. Paste this in this GraphQL Voyager and change schema. So what has happened just now is, can you guys see it? Okay. What has happened is it has laid down in a nice graphical form uh, all, the, all the object types we have created and all the entry points. So we could really lay out our entire domain in a graph form and put it on walls. I think we were talking about that. And you, you really know what relationships different entities have. And we could go beyond, like, you know, we could have incentives, regions, photos, name anything. And you don't worry about underlying database. They could still sit in Elasticsearches or Solars or, uh, you know, uh, MongoDBs, DynamoDB, whatever you call it. With this, I got a signal of five minutes time, so I need to keep moving. This was my backup in case my demo didn't work. So I always plan for backup. So uh, GraphQL architecture. Now, we know GraphQL is a query language uh, on API. And this, this pink or what are we, pink color, this is saying GraphQL server. There are different architectural approaches. One is you could have this sitting right on top of your database. Uh, Another approach is where GraphQL server could talk to your current legacy systems or microservices or third party. This is what uh, uh, Coursera did. They put a layer which is on top of their existing services and they're on GraphQL 100%. And then you could use a hybrid. Now, the point I'm trying to make is we need to be cautious. We don't want to build a monolith, a GraphQL monolith server. So, uh, so we, you know, we will end up from one problem to another one. So mobile, rest web. mobile or EFS rest web yeah. and mobile. Yeah. So, uh, last couple of slides. Uh, now there are GraphQL clients. And if I talk in context of rest, uh, all of you, uh, everyone who's using rest services right now, you know, there is a rest client and either gateway is a rest client or, you know, we had embedded rest client. Similarly, there are, GraphQL REST clients or GraphQL clients, which take care of rudimentary stuff. It could take care of caching. Uh, it takes care of your UI integration, UI framework integration, like with React or uh, Angular or whatever. Uh, and it it helps you build your cache. And some of the example, some of the things we are exploring right now are Apollo, and I think Relay is something which uh, which has good integration with uh, React. So we'll be talking to Venom team Real uh, Monday, you know, on uh, where to proceed next. Uh, other interesting thing, AWS has come up with AppSync, which they are saying is fully managed GraphQL service. It's in, you have to subscribe, it's not public yet. So uh, we'll keep an eye and see what they come up with. Uh, to my last slide, I think uh, takeaways, if I have to say, I think uh, the key here is still, I think it's not really about APIs. It is about giving agility, efficiency, and innovation capability to business. And that's the whole reason we were doing APIs or we are even talking about GraphQL. So whenever you build an API, don't think in context of your use case or the web page you are building. Think about uh, you know what, how, how you are making business agile as a, as a whole and you know, uh, and how you're making efficient, how others could use your APIs. And last points, I think, so I don't want you to go and think, hey, we are replacing all our APIs, REST APIs, so-called REST APIs with GraphQL, that's not happening. APIs are going to stay till, you know, I don't know, next couple of years. Uh, and we are looking at uh, GraphQL adoption uh, and we will be having design discussions with Venom platform team uh, in context of solving a real world problem for which we made some progress already, uh, but we have to figure out integration. So with that I would end here. Thank you. Any questions?
You were in that room, so yeah, you're not allowed. I was the one that about the coherence. Oh, you were the one? Okay. <laughs> so you talked about GraphQL and had you talked about GraphQL and had some uh, caching strategies, mm -hmm. but with our existing um, APIs, what type of, like on high level, uh, what type of caching strategies are we currently using and possibly in the future, what would we be using? So uh, I didn't touch base on a concept uh, Facebook came up with that's called data loader. So that, and I think that's a really important question because we still need to be careful about not doing N plus one queries from GraphQL and avoiding calling data which is already fetched from still you know your APIs. So there is this concept of data loader which takes care of caches and it, it even stop making calls. So it's a cache at server level and we were even thinking or we haven't done a lot of research yet, but Redis which is right now uh, working as a cache for our API layers, uh, we have to think of something, but I think these are a couple of options. You know, uh, First thing is looking at data loader which is Facebook, uh, Facebook open source that. We currently, use Redis currently we use Redis and Guava and HTTP cache. We are going to miss HTTP cache once we go to uh, our CDN cache. We need to figure out uh, impact on CDN caching uh, once we go to GraphQL. Thank you. A little related question. So it's not gonna solve all your performance issues because if it's a metal layer mm -hmm. and if your rest layer still returns big blobs and that's the only way it returns, it will still make the whole request. So there's no way without rewriting your REST request to optimize for that, right? That, that's a good point, that's a good point. So, and that's where I think this caching, yeah, you have to have uh, optimized backend. You can't really I, you can't really write bad queries and expect GraphQL to. So I think what, uh, I, I didn't say, quote this thing, what you're saying is GraphQL is not the silver bullet. It's still going to must, you still need to take care of all aspects. What it does is, uh, it initially we're looking at you know, how do you do composites? Now, if I need vehicle data and I'm saying, hey, give me photos, or if I'm saying, hey, I need inventory data, give me options, price of options. Right now, the only way we is we are going to make two calls uh, from the client end. You're going to avoid that out, out of the network call. Plus, uh, we are going to be faster because we are faster in terms of delivery time. You can test things faster. You don't have to really do uh, backend aggregation or you don't have to modify your uh, current API to start joining data from different places. It gives you option to join data. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Or not. <laughs> going once, going twice. Okay, thank you, Nitin. Thank you.